Thank you all for joining me for this, uh, my last recital here at CU. It's a lecture recital. I'm really excited to bring this to you all. Really, really amazing, awesome work. And thank you to all of those watching on YouTube as well. Um, so this is uh, Janacek's Diary of Learning Spanish. And in, in part of my research and working through this piece and performing it later on after this lecture is done, is to deepen, uh, provide a deeper meaning and understanding when performing this work and also when listening to this work, because sometimes Janacek can be considered a little bit esoteric or maybe sometimes hard to latch onto. And hopefully, in the process of this lecture, very short, and when we transition into the actual performance of the piece, you'll be more comfortable understanding a little bit of the compositional language that Janacek is working with. So just a little bit of background, I won't get too much into it, but uh, Leo Shanchek was born in 1854 and died in 1928. Um, he was a composer, a pedagogue, he spans himself a, a folklorist, and also a researcher, and sometimes through his own study in uh, Czech language and speech work, a little bit of a linguist as well as he started using it more and more and understanding a little bit about the psychology and pathology that works when actually working with Czech and using it. Um, during the early periods of his time, right up until even 1906 when he um, premiered the opera Yenufa, he was very frustrated about not really getting a lot of recognition in Prague. And it wasn't until the, when Yenufa was remounted in 1916 that he finally felt like he had come and came into his own. Incidentally, Around this time, as well as when he started to meet, he met a uh, love of his life, Camilla Struskova. And from there, built on latching more and more into the Moravian folklore and the Moravian sounds that he grew to be known for as he was composing, along with writing a wave of nationalism at this time as well, based off of what the Horshak and Smethanov was doing. Um, on May 14th, 1916, a series of poems in a very, the People's Journal was printed anonymously. And this is where we find the poems of a cycle called A Pen of the Self Taught Peasant, and it was published in this paper. It was believed anonymous until way later on, it actually ended up being found as Osef Kalga, who we knew this based on a couple of different things. One being, Probably someone that was an unlearned peasant wouldn't be really writing in high poetry at the time, though he was trying his best to highlight and showcase a little bit of that as he was doing it. Um, but some linguists and scholars basically found that that would be the case that they wouldn't be doing that. Um, the cycle consists of 23 poems, or 22 to be more exact, with number 13 uh, in there in the poetry actually being a series of dashes. And Janacek will take this and actually use it as a piano interlude, which is also alluding to um, the act of the two lovers that we we'll see and hear about consummating their, their marriage, not marriage, but their, their lust for each other. Um, the poetry uh, and the poems themselves portray the Wallachian dialect, which is um, very similar to what Janacek would be growing up with at, in his own village. And it tells the story of when a young, respectable farmer's son is tempted away into the forest by a young gypsy girl um, to leave his home forever once that happens. Um, he will succumb to the temptation as we hear in the cycle, but also in the poetry itself, you see this push and pull and fighting between each other as these, these, less, these evil forces and not evil forces. Um, the composition, as what Janacek was using, began around 1917. We know this from letters to Camilla um, Shishlova. It wasn't completed until 1919, and then not premiered until a friend of his, a conductor and student, um, premiered the work in 1921 in the Concert Hall in Brno. Um, just a little bit more about that text. Like I said, it was from the uh, self Peasant Peasants, his three poems, and a lot of the text that he, when he was reading this, he left unchanged and only added a little bit of dramatic impulse, usually repeated words in the cycle itself, in order to heighten the drama. And you see it's a very large, large dramatic, operatic in a lot of ways, chamber recital, chamber, um, the whole work. 
There's an unmistakable connection between this composition and what will happen after this composition, this composition was done with his love and admiration for Ms. Strisco, which actually he met in 1917 while beginning to arrange this, this cycle. Uh, the importance of Camilla Strisco continued to grow and grow through the months and years of Janáček's life, going all the way up until he passes away, when actually Camilla's son and herself were at his deathbed when he passed away in the hospital. There is a genesis that comes in this, and we will see it more and more as you read and listen to the poetry, that we <coughs> know that Janáček was beginning to turn this infatuation and this lust and this love for this woman and inputting it everywhere to all the music that he's writing, eventually showing up a little bit later on into a love theme and a love melody and a love motive itself. With that, talk a little bit about just an overview of Janáček's compositional style, especially in this part of this later period, this golden age of his own writing. We really see a lot of Moravian Bohemian folklore and attachments to it. Yenifa was the first that kind of really launched him into really launching into and latching into more rustic folklore and folksy ideas and, and lyricism. And as that influence grew, especially in Moravia, as he where he grew up, we see more and more of this material grow. And he, we see it so in the dances that he used the modalities that he will use, and just the text itself. Another thing that we know is we call it chasso, um, sorry, chassopy, or rhetoric evolution. So these tiny little phrases, very short, um, sometimes even half a measure, that he'll use and evolve over and over again to fill out the rest of a, of a texture, usually based on what we'll find out later, with their speech melodies. The speech melody is super important because where we know his interest into the Czech language, his own language, his native tongue, he wrote down and would sit in coffee shops, sit around the parks, and just write and sketch what he heard. And all of this, you know, there's hundreds that we have found, and I'm sure even more, that we know that he uses for first starting in a foot and going all the way forward. And these are our building blocks of those Mosaic evolution, those high level movements. And I think what's super important here, even though the music is a little bit more dense, thanks to this very natural layering, he has a pluralistic view of, view of modalities, but he's very much not, he's not, does not believe in atonality. In fact, his love for folk song and folk dance, as we'll see a quote a little bit later on, he mentioned that without without tonality, you can't have folk song and folk dance. That's how free that idea is. So those are the main ideas and compositional tools that we'll see in the explore a little bit. The broad picture is, for Moravian and William folklore, so a lot of rustic images in this cycle we talk about with Yannick or Janáček, the young lad who gets whisked away to the forest, he's a farm worker. A lot of some of the songs refer to as his oxen doing field work, not being able to focus on the field work because of the kind of mysticism that um, Zephyr with Gypsy is, is giving. There's also a family religious devoutness to this. And because of that, there's this extra added layer of why um, Gypsy culture and mysticism on top of uh, Czech, a lot of themes are about freedom and who is more reactionary than today in master class, Professor Chi was here, talking about actually there's nothing more free than the gypsy people. They can pick up and go from one place to another. And so a lot of that also is helping pull Janáček and the cycle, I know it's confusing his name is Janáček and the cycle as well, kind of away from that life and being more willing to leave for Zetka. And then a very more classical term found in German folklore, Bohemian folklore, Moravian folklore, this idea of these mystical woods, this Lorelei forest, always trying to tempt everyone away, literally a song that we'll hear, the gypsy song in this piece. And this all is being built and utilized as Ayanachek and attempts to further just get back to his roots as a composer and a Czech um, and a Moravian. 
The influence of Volkswagen and Hans, and this is very, very clear, is a rhythmic freedom within this meter, though simple and compound at times. These are also built on these uh, Czech speech mel melodies. Um, and I think it's impossible to separate the importance from those two ideas, but we're going to do a little bit of that coming up in a second. There's also global scale influences. The entire mess of shapes of three note idioms. There's a lot of, um, as you'll hear, these three quick little notes that are always related, and even as we look at a little bit later on, um, those are notions that we see. Folk dance is also very important, especially the dramatic impulses that will occur in this. One of the most important moments, actually, in the entire piece, the piece has worked with no key signature until the very second to last song, where we finally have a flat major, which is actually a dance itself. It's a kind of a children's, almost childish, childlike song that we'll hear talking about the love that Janacek has for Zefka. So, one very simple, this is in the sixth song, we're, we'll hear this coming up. Is we see the very the very free rhythm, it's that lilting feeling. It's this is what we're talking about when he's not able to focus in the fields working with his ox because he keeps thinking about Zephyr in the back of his mind. We hear a little bit of that being drawn out. But this is one great example of how we have this rhythmic influence that is for sure heightened by the idea and that connection to the folk, folk music and folk style dancing. Another really great one, this is the same song, you see that usage of all the touches and yet we have even more duples against triples, that feeling right there, so we even have more syncopation, which is a very common um, Moravian Bohemian dance style. You always are feeling some form of syncopation at some points. It's always free, that's the whole idea. And then at the very end, song 20, we have, this is that uh, childlike song, we have a yum bum, we have a bum, yum bum, we have a bum, bum, we have literally a, almost a wedding feeling, like a, a wedding style dance almost. This buoyant happiness that we'll hear will get dragged down a little bit, but it's that idea, again, with folk song and folk dance being utilized. The next aspect we're going to do more deeply into and spend a large part of this lecture about our speech melodies and these natural inflections and pitch relationships that we use. So we can modify, um, we can really identify two major styles of speech melody utilized in this piece. The first is going to be a motive that's really a starts at a little bit of higher pitch and gradually descends down. That is a very common check inflection dial. Um, pathology anyway, and so we just hear it even more in this idea. Another one that we'll hear in here that Janacek actually found out by listening and uh, working with children was this threatening intonation, always going high. We'll see this a lot. So in there are about some, uh, some theorists, they try to, I think, overcomplicate it by saying it's usually always appears itself in a fourth, in a rising fourth. I think in general what we're looking for is with so much of this music as you'll hear today, this evening, kind of ends in a down slope. Whenever it ends in an upslope, it always tends to be in this threatening manner. Literally, it was an example we'll look at. Um, can't be more threatening than it actually can be. And then, in the same idea of that old or early oration idea that um, you're all seated around a campfire and you're telling the story. So, the ideas of kind of bringing in either through pitch relationship, bringing down the pitch level, repeating text to draw people in around the campfire to tell the story. This is another thing that he will use in speech melodies and kind of to go bring in and out of it as we'll, we'll see, both when it won't be as quick that we hear, but he's always trying to bring them in to this kind of campfire storytelling of some leaving vanishing. So the first one, Observation and there are a couple of these. Observation A, so this is that downward sloping. It's always going down. Another one. It's all tumamochi, sorry. It's always going, it's, it's even at the hit a high note. We're not very long because the inflection has to go down. It's more naturalistic in how we would speak the check. Another example, when we extend out, so we're not as quick, uh, very specifically, 
where you look for those 16th notes, it's usually very quick, but we can also have that same relationship as we expand it out. So in this instance, oh, bullshit, rolls bullshit. So we still have that idea of going downward in intonation, but that same concept. Observation B, we have that threatening tone. It's literally what's happening here, not to spoil the story, but Janacek, this is the time, this is the morning after. He's threatening his ox to stop staring at him and judging him. So literally, we're going up in intonation and pitch because we're th literally threatening our ox to stop judging us. Another one, this is talking, um, yeah, um, it's another idea where this is when we are about to Right, to cut our own fingers off a little bit. Um, what may happen before here? The self doubt, the self mutilation, and anger at oneself for doing the deed, but also being happy that the deed was done. Another example of that. This goes into that storytelling. He doesn't use it, the repeated text in terms of immediate repeated text. He doesn't use it very often. I mean, this is the very first song. And we see here. We have that higher inflection, that higher feeling, and we got it a little bit lower as if we're drawing people in to just to really. This is the very first song I mentioned to, as we set the scene going forward. We have one more, the same idea, where we have a full, full phrase as we go through. And again, we're kind of drawing people in. This is a self doubt of the, where. There's a self-inward negligence of accepting one's feelings, and this is exactly what's happening here as we're telling the story. So the other idea that is used a lot is scientific evolution, the Shakespeare. That we have these sort of sporadic music cells, even when we just see we've already seen a little bit of that idea, but it gets exploded out in a really natural, cool way based on speech melodies, these building blocks as we keep going forward. And one of the big ways that we, we know that we use these, it's not really like motifs, it's not what Wagner did, but it's enough relationship that we'll hear orally to the text that we've just heard. Um, these are this constantly oral transformations, these, these associations with the book, the text we just heard. So a huge one is going to be our love motive, which starts in Diary of Manage. And we'll see as the entire relationship with Strislova, and all the basically a large chunk of the repertoire and, um, and compositions that he writes afterwards, including two, two operas, string quartet, um, something that was left unfinished, and sent letters as well. All of these, and I actually um, a little bit of side research as well. He bequeathed these, these all of these, including Diary of Manage. To Camilla Strislova as performance and their in fact her rights, which is very good. So this is our love motive here. It's usually always related to a flat minor key, sometimes well as a major key as well. And we have these three note terminals that we already talked about. So A flat, D flat, E flat. Or another version of it. So we have two different ideas when we're all connected. I mentioned um, actually to Dr. Chi, this is my favorite slide because everywhere it occurs is basically the entire cycle. One, three, four, five, eight, nine, 11, 12. It's, it's constantly being used. And it's not always being used in a loving way. It is somehow, it's used, it's referencing. It's always a little bit amorous, but also anxiety filled for Yanashev. And it keeps going back and forth as we see until the very end of the cycle where we have a cathartic moment. First one idea, right off the bat. It looks a little weird, get an A flat, B flat, right in that chord right there. All on top of. So we all are in that same motive and idea. There's another one, one of my favorite. This is when, um, yeah, this is when Seth is here. 
So do I buy these coins? So we had all these moments and motives right here, even. Another really cool one, I'm thinking of just a couple, there are dozens in this second cycle that we could talk about right now, but these are a couple I want to showcase. One is actually going back to that idea of you cannot escape, one, I mean, man cannot escape their fate. So here we have med Hege. so that's our, our speech rhythm. And again, what we're seeing now is it's not just a piano requisite, but what we're going to see in a couple of seconds here is how many is pervasive this is. Right there, same motive later on. We have it, there's 16 notes all the way until eventually they're going continuously. speech melody itself as we're building. Here we see it all over the place. Not just in that right hand, but also in the left hand. And in this little spooky, spooky music as we about to have some spirits. We have it yet at the bottom. So we're always talking about you can't escape. There's no escaping this feeling, this, this drawing in of what's happening to Yanachek. This um, woman has bewitched him, and in all the forces of this <coughs> rustic landscape, this love, this beauty, is slowly drawing him more and more away from his life at home. And this one might be a little bit more stretched, but I do hear it. So we have the da 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 So it's augmented, it's <coughs> placed a little more. So it's constantly bringing that speech melody back and reminding everyone what's going on. Another really cool moment and feature of this chamber cycle is that what I mentioned prior to one poem is completely just filled with dashes. And this is filled by Janacek by using a piano solo that's utilizing two different motives and themes that we're going to see and look at here. The first big one is Mala Oshinka. This is being used. Yam, bam, 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 bam. This idea that we're doing that fall, and the rise, and the back fall, and the rise again. Another one that's being utilized at the very end, that we're already seeing a little bit of a 30 second move, Nezabu, Nezabu, that we're in consonants together with. And what Janacek does brilliantly is bring these two together. It's the idea that he has these two motives, these two building blocks, and will not smash them together, but in fact, weave them together to create a full musical moment and with texture, melody, and lyricism. So now we have an egg. We have Nezabudu, but um bum, but um bum. Until so finally, then we have Do uh, we have that idea of that 
yam, bam, badam. These change it ever so slightly by taking it away from triplets. But it's the same motive and transformation of that motive that's weaved through the entire moment of this um, very erotic moment between Yamachek and Sefka. So, why is it important to know, as a performer, all these different ideas? And the, the big thing is that it gives a great understanding of this Czech language. It helps in a lot of ways, especially once you get used to the, these little motivic ideas and the speech melody. It makes it easier to speak and pronounce the Czech at times. It also makes it easier to understand and learn as you're going through the cycle and that is as immense as this is 22 songs, 21 for the, I mean, 21 songs total in being sung. There's also a psychological connection to being hyper-connected to the word you just spoke, not just because you just sung them, but because it's being thrown around all in your home, in the whole oral realm that you're seeing here, both in the piano piece and the piano moments, and how we're manipulating that and psychologically connecting to the text we're doing. There's vocal pacing that's also going to be super important that we learn through this by understanding where we need to give in terms of give and take with the piano texture and what we're working with. And then obviously a greater collaboration with people with the piano. This whole week has been super special. We, um, Dr. Cheek and I basically put this cycle together this week fully. And what's been interesting is the collaboration that we've shown going back and forth between why well, hear this and I hear this, and we actually create a stronger understanding and peace. As an audience experience, I think it's also very important that you feel a more clear and dramatic arc as you go forward in this oral world and where you're not your imagination will run wild. Wow. And I specifically only picked a couple of these short motives for you to point out because I want to see what else is drawn out from what you're understanding and hearing. Again, also that music of understanding is part of that. You understand now that you're going to be listening for a rise and fall in pitch level. You recognize that as one of that speech spellings. You might be listening a little bit for when a, when a phrase ends on a higher note as opposed to a lower note. What is that in terms of your connected to? Is this a threat? Is this some kind of negative emotion that's being that's occurring. So it's also helping you have a psychological connection to what's also happening and going on, along with understanding the musical language. Um, with that, we're going to transition like five, five, five or so minutes as we get ready and prep to, to present the cycle for you all. And what I invite you all to do as you read, we'll have super tires going up on here as well, so you don't you know, have to necessarily put Ages if you want to just kind of listen and, and be involved that way. But we'll have some questions and answers at the very end of the cycle as we talk a little bit more about what we might have heard. I need clarifications that you might have had from the lecture itself. But now uh, I'll take a couple of minutes here, take a stretch, and then we'll dive into some Yamacha.
Thank you. 
was like, oh wow, all of this emotion that's in language I don't speak uh, was really coming through along with your face and body posture. But it wouldn't have been explainable, you know, but then with the translation and then with the like children's rising thing and then you were so angry and it's like this guy's really in conflict. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't understand that he's just discombobulated. So it was very helpful to have the speech rhythms that explain along with everything else. It was, and the music was so gorgeous. Yeah, it's it, awesome. Really yeah, good. it doesn't have to be thorny and, and scary. You know, I mean, Czech is, and Czech doesn't have to be that high. Um, it's it's a very accessible language. It's a very vowel dominant language. It has a lot of consonants, but it's it's so direct vowel driven that um, part of my pedagogic research, not just out of this performance research, is actually using Czech in undergraduate teaching and showcasing using that to help technique. Um, I had many conversations with Dr. Chief when we're putting this together about how actually this is outside of being great at night. This is actually very easy to sing because of the Czech. Um, if it was any other language, like if I tried to sing this in the German, I think it'd be a completely different feeling because of all the issues that happen in German, not only technically, but also uh, diction wise as well. There's even more negotiation I think that's to occur almost. So, awesome. mm -hmm. yes, no, bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so we're gonna, the first question I have is how important we have all keeping silence place? And so a little bit of how this um, is set up, it's actually very much like a typical almost Greek drama where you have these very, very standard pauses. We have song one, which is an interlude, or sorry, an introduction, there's, it's a taka in there, but there's a whole chunk of about eight songs, seven songs, sorry, before we have a pause. Um, it actually really says the name of it, so we're actually supposed to take a break. I think it's partly a little bit of stamina, mental, language, pianistic stamina as we keep going, especially at the very end, we used to get two chunks, then a pause, then one chunk, then a pause, because it's such a large undertaking, because it's still 22 songs, even if I'm not part of all of it, but also helps break up the scenic idea. So silence is super, super important. It's not utilized a lot in this outside of these pauses, which could be for any number of reasons of um, why. I, I find it interesting you say that because I actually heard a lot of like, the piano solo. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of those um, sort of dramatic causes, like I mean, short moments of silence and rest. But I mean, Dr. Gigi, what do you think about the significance of those? Or other than? Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, that answer is if, um, this has been down to the stage several times, a bunch of times actually. I think that's it's. It's not it's overtly operatic and how he tries to not be so operatic about it, just be more organic. But I mean that piano kind of solo, you can you can hear a young man who's probably never part of my language had sex before. Mm -hmm. And so there's that 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 hesitancy, but also excitement, which is very clearly that towards the end where you finally have the excitement. And you, you can kind of hear the swell of music when it comes in. But those mm -hmm. those Initial punches and dots, those three note rhythm modus specifically, sorry. Um, for sure, utilizes that idea that, that drama that right. he's trying to be organic about by using those those tiny cells. I have one more question. Is there, um, or maybe two actually, is there a fate motive? Uh, because fate is like a really heavy. Net I would argue that the net potential. That, that is the idea, which once it's introduced, uh, it's the, the, the whole concept is in the first six songs that, uh, that you can't escape once they have mm -hmm. it. And I think it's drawn in there ever so often, usually more strung out, I think, and then until we get back to the total swings and the total variable, where it's everywhere all the time. You just, yeah, it's everywhere. So there is for sure a thing. Right. I don't think it's as prevalent, it is prevalent in this. I don't think it's as strong of a draw as the love motive and right. that stuff. Is there one for family? No. Do you talk about the themes of like family devotion and religious devotion? And so I guess both yeah. religion and family if that's well so sometimes um, so a couple of the kind of that occur in the is actually already in that love motive. 
So it's also that idea that it's that duplicitousness. It's not just love lust, but also love reverence to family as well, which is a huge, huge thing. I do have another one. What about supernatural events? Okay, so you can think of it. Because um, there was a couple moments where you're like, ah, it's very dark eyes. I don't know, it's probably that good, like creeping out there. But is it, I mean, there, there are elements of the supernatural. Did you talk about like. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely that element in terms of just Marine and Bohemian and Germanic folk tales, like we mentioned before, that, you know, who scary things in the forest. But also about what do you mean, how many songs are set on the Lord of Life, especially in your theater, mm-hmm. uh, and in some Czech, Czech song as well. So that's a huge, huge aspect of it. But I think it comes for in this piece more so as the more of a lust towards the Zepka as it is magic. Mm-hmm. But you know, you can you can twist that in a way that will maybe on it. It is magical. That lust, that emotion never felt before in a form of magic that can be captured that way as well. Yeah. But even then, even in those moments, like the black eyes, one of the flash, the flashing eyes, I think in the text, um, I believe is in the love of it. It's in that modality. So even then, it's always being utilized in that way somehow. Do you find him sympathetic? In lower. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anybody else, but I like, have that question as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like how 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 have you interpreted um uh you know the fact that he does go against all of the things that he believes? You you know, do you find that sympathetic or do you find that you know, do you think also do you think Hannah Check was portraying him sympathetically or not? Well, so there's for sure that motion you know, the street of composers side of things. So what wasn't mentioned in the presentation, but I, it, it is pertinent, but it's not. So the big thing about this love story between Janacek and Camilla is that they were married. Mm-hmm. It's also been reciprocated. Mm-hmm. Oh. So there is that whole aspect of it where, it, I mean, and you can really dive deep, especially post I mean, Diary really is a, it's an important work, but it's a monumental work as well, but it really is a, it's a, you can almost put a stopwatch on. This is when it starts getting a little out of hand, especially toward the end of it, and how often he's using the love motive, how much he's writing Camilla, how much he's dedicating to Camilla, almost blatantly in front of his wife. I mean, the fact that he gives rights to performing some of these works. It, it, so, it, it, yeah. It, well, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, Camilla was his inspiration, not just for this, but for. Katya Kabanova and Krakow's case, um, and other works too. Do you find it's a heroic calling to the last piece in that case? Mm-hmm. Like, does he win and get what he wants in the end? Well, that's, I mean, my interpretation is that you finally the shackles of, you know, because you can, you can get very, very, very philosophical with this, you know, how many chains do you tie yourself down to when, to not? Feel free, mm-hmm. and so in this way, it's at the is a physical, actual being, but also as a way of you know maybe he doesn't really want to work in the field all day. Maybe he doesn't really know. It's back and forth because he loves his sister a lot. There's a lot of allusions to that that he doesn't want to leave, like think the 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 glimmer in his eye or something like that to the very end. You know, like so there's still that push and pull, but there's a free motion. I think also that's why the scene actually at the very end is so important because the top of the note every single time draws us to be flat. It's never usually that sustained either. So it's not just that we have a new height and a new freedom from this idea, but also I also I think it's very important that you know C natural is very important to be flat. So it's also part of that. Well how did you feel at the end? Yeah. <laughs> I well I wrote a lot of uh, one line commentary on the songs towards the end, like, oh how surprising decides to go back. Um, <laughs> and, then, oh. um, and then, yeah. I mean, I've been a lot about, um, I just sort of how it feels about the way women are portrayed mm-hmm. in it, a um, little bit off-putting, yeah. but that's, I mean, that's the, the times um, and something we have to deal with, especially in places where religion is such a huge 
um, a huge motivator for morality and yep. things like that. But I don't know, just seeing him completely vilify Zed and then move into being like, this is my life now. Um, I personally do not find him to be. So he gets a it is a whiplash journey, both mm-hmm. in the text and in the singing, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, oh, did it cancel? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when, when I first looked at this uh, some years ago, I was like, you know, what's, what's the problem? Boy meets girl, girl loves boy, boy loves girl. Boy is a racist. Well, I think, I think you have to look at that line mm-hmm. and what that meant for him to to fall in love with a, a gypsy woman, totally different culture. Uh, yes, different color stand, but different culture. It meant he, he's bound to the land, to his family, and to traditions that goes back probably centuries. You know, that's just what they did. And then for him to be with her, there's no way, I guess, that she could leave her way of life. Mm-hmm. Join the farm, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that's just not mm-hmm. that. And in fact, she still is, I mean, she still is her, her sister's shirt. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And he can't even tell, he can't right. explain it to her. Even if, if, if Yannick wants to, Yannick and Yannick and Yannick and Yannick wants to, to, to share. I found it interesting that Zepko was a villain, but she was, uh, she doesn't face consequences, and neither really does the. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I don't know. I mean, I guess the consequence is the baby, but. Well, the consequence is he has to give up everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do think that was a nice reversal yeah. mm-hmm. in terms of like the adaptive language. Usually it's like the woman is receiving the brunt of the, right. uh, the change and facing the consequences. So that was interesting. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's weird because, you know, and Aristotelian Greek playwrights, you know, you have that last moment of catharsis, and it's, it's a different kind of catharsis when you look at it in either either lens. It's all it's really more of a musical catharsis and not so much anything else, but then you have to really be like right, leaving behind mm-hmm. in order to, to, to continue forward. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's great. Yeah. 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 Thank you. This is a wonderful. Yeah. That last seal. Yeah. Now I have two people in the room. And now I can do it again. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. She's seen it all. Three years worth of just straight for the entire Hi, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>